Yo, all Snapchat, so I think all social change, all movements in history and all social movements in the future will be driven by technology at their core, and then the movement follows up. The general assumption is usually that grassroots activism is what kind of causes a groundswell of activity and protests and petitions and all those things build up until you get enough momentum that that causes change. And no doubt things like protests and petitions definitely build up an awareness and, and get a, a large enough scale to the point where politics starts to take notice, but then politics still lags in actually taking action. I mean, even today we have big political issues where there's generally a large um, consensus among the public. Things like gay marriage, things like action on climate change, things like asylum seekers, and yet there's no political action. I think one of the main reasons why politics doesn't work and doesn't take action anymore is because it works on four-year election cycles. You don't want to make long-term plans or big kind of controversial bets if you want to get re-elected. Like, it's pretty obvious here, yeah? like, if you legalise gay marriage, even if, the, even if most of the politicians within a party want to do that and agree that it's the right thing to do, the party can't because they'll lose all their evangelical Christian voters. Or if they implement an emissions trading scheme to help, you know, combat climate change and global warming, then suddenly they've got to fight the um, fossil fuel lobby and they lose all that money and jobs go and blah. That and the huge underlying issue is that technology doubles almost every 18 months. So in a four-year election cycle, technology has doubled twice. You think of just eight years ago when Obama first came into office, most people didn't have smartphones. Again, I don't mean to belittle the work of activists in all these social movements um, and social change, but let's just go along, go along with me on this thought experiment where technology is the core driver. Technology makes those movements happen. Okay, so in the African-American civil rights movement of the 1960s, that was actually the moment when television sets became cheap enough that everyone had one in their living room. And so now you've got mass kind of media. And typically what this meant is that any kind of racial injustice well, wasn't just limited to its local neighbourhood, you know, from word of mouth and people talking about it, but it was actually broadcast to a national audience and people understood what was happening. You could probably argue that the hippie counterculture movement of the 1960s was also powered by technologies like LSD and books and magazines and the dissemination of that information throughout the entire populace. The fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 could actually be attributed to uh, fax machines that were widespread across the USSR and so that allowed for the dissemination of information to break down authoritarian regimes. And then you've got the rise of the internet, now suddenly everyone has a, a open, free and distributed platform globally to discuss any issue without threat of violence. And I'm sure you can go find a whole bunch of graphs that show the rise of the internet and the decline of other kind of uh, indoctrinated beliefs and, and racism, uh, even things like religion have been dropping off because people got more information. Then you've got things like WikiLeaks and Twitter kind of like spurring and being the core driver for the Arab Springs movement to overthrow all the dictators in, in the Middle East. And that's awesome. And now platforms like Facebook Live are kind of bringing back a resurgence of the civil rights movement because we're seeing black people being shot by police just for no real reason in America almost every day. And while Facebook does have a profit motive, I think Zuckerberg um, and a lot of people at Facebook really understand that by connecting the world, we can kind of like see, expose the world's injustices and empathize with each other more. But since humans are really just meme machines, there's an interesting way to analyze this because you can basically, um, so Kevin Kelly, uh, uh, founder of Wired, he always talks about this idea of what does technology want? Technology is the core drive. And one of the things technology wants is for information to be free. And we, we've seen that, you know, we, we're seeing things like WikiLeaks and all this information being shared and shared and shared. And that is what drives social change. Okay, so how do we fix these problems from a technological point of view? If, if technology is the core driver, how do we leverage technology to fix today's big issues? Because politics isn't going to do it for us. I really don't like protests and, uh, and petitions. I have a bunch of friends who do it and I respect them for it on, on big issues like climate change and, and gay marriage and asylum seekers. But politics is still the limiting factor. I definitely don't have all the answers, but let's just throw out a few bunch of ideas on how you can solve five of the big issues that we're kind of facing in 2016, and I'll kind of summarize them now. Let's go. So human rights, equality, uh, violence, environment, and wealth distribution. Oh, see what I did there? <laughs> so obviously asylum seekers should be treated more humanely, um, and we should shut down things like detention centers or do some different thing that's not as like evil, um, and people should have basic human rights. So food, water, shelter, clothing, electricity, and telecommunications. Everyone probably should have access to the internet at a certain speed and a smartphone or some way to access the internet. We have the capability, the abundance, the money, the resources um, for the political leaders of the world to get together and just say, okay, cool, let's just uh, provide all those resources to everyone, end poverty, end world hunger. But that won't happen. So what you can do is actually create a universal basic income, but do it on the blockchain, on Ethereum. So it means that there's no central control, no government's control, it's for everyone. A lot of these ideas will involve the blockchain uh, and Ethereum, things like that, because they're outside the realm and reach of politics and law. They operate everywhere and nowhere. So there's potential to build a basic income system on a blockchain that is universally available to everyone. Basically, everyone on the planet gets a universal basic income, enough to cover all their basic needs. And there's a bunch of people right now, a bunch of developers around the world who are trying to solve this problem. Um, one I know of, uh, a good mate of mine, uh, Johan, who's doing this thing called Taxines, which is really awesome. 
basically it creates like a kind of like hidden dividend value sharing system so that what you would do is you would um, buy goods and services from DAOs, from companies that give back to this platform. So for example, a company might decide to donate 5% of all its profits to this, this blockchain DAO and it goes into a big pool and then out of that pool everyone gets paid a share of that basic income. And the hope with that is that it kind of like builds up a self-organizing system because then you'd be incentivized to, to reach out to companies and uh, do business with companies that give a higher share back to that system. Okay, for asylum seekers, uh, another thing is a universal ID DAO and a universal ID system on the blockchain. Not the, so they can be tracked and like controlled, but so they have freedom. Because one of the reasons why there are these detention centers is because people don't come across with their papers. Um, because when you, you know, when the government's bombing the fuck out of you, you're not gonna, you know, go and knock on their door and say, hey, can I have the papers before I run? And particularly in third world countries, they don't really have a, an ID system. They don't have uh, like a birth and, birth and death registrar, or they might have it, but not many people actually choose to go and do it. And if you grow up in a third world country where your, your parents basically didn't go about giving you a you know a, an ID, an identification system, or registering you somewhere, it's very hard to set up a bank account or do other things in the modern world. And this is where the blockchain is perfect because no government controls it. It's universally accessible and open and, and transparent for everyone. So you can store your ID on there, you can store your documents, you can store your data, and you're in control of it. Having a verifiable universal ID on the blockchain um, enables you to open up even like a, a digital, a virtual bank, a blockchain-based bank, and you're not having to be controlled by anyone. You're in control always. Actually, the last set of Ethereum meetup, which uh, myself and a bunch of mates organized, we met a guy who was a CTO at a massive company who's quit that, and he wants to build this universal ID system to help solve sex trafficking around the world. I get equality, so you can just have a, a marriage-based DAO, uh, a, a blockchain-based DAO that actually registers births and deaths and marriages, void of any government, outside of government control. Imagine if you just could access all of the governments in the world's births, deaths, and marriages registrars and will registrars and all that sort of thing, um, hack them, pull the data down, and create a global DAO. And the cool thing with smart contracts on Ethereum is that you can actually code in rules so that uh, you can code in what happens when you die if you're in your will, what happens when you get divorced, all that sort of thing. I mean, for Gary marriage, beyond the whole like religious dogma and kind of you know archaic thinking, it's it's really all just about uh, tax and assets and asset sharing between two people. Yeah, uh, gender equality, particularly like the pay gap between different genders, like just open up the fucking salaries, free your salaries and share it with each other so that you all know and you can see clearly if it's discrimination. Racial inequality, I think things like uh, Facebook Live and that, those kind of platforms that are constantly like, you know, we all have cameras in our pockets. I think if we just use that tool more and more, almost like 24-7 automatic, it'd be great. Violence, um, so things like basic income and giving everyone in the world basic needs. Uh, you know, if, if you've got all your needs covered, there's really no need to be violent because it's like, you know. And things like VR and live video and internet access and, you know, connecting the other 3 billion in, uh, people on the planet who aren't connected yet, that kind of helps us share our story and have, build more compassion and empathy with each other. And the blockchain will also decentralize the government. There's a bunch of projects trying to do this, so things like BitNation. Um, typically, you can look back in history, and violence is inherently relegated to government. This is one of the core arguments of like crypto anarchy and like the anarcho-capitalist movements, where they're saying that only governments are the, the, have the ability to amass enough resources to build armies and pay for armies and weapons of mass destruction. And for things like terrorism, I actually think um, a something like what the NSA has built, but not controlled by the NSA, actually a thing that's distributed and kind of like for the good of all, all humanity, it's not owned by like the ultimate thing would be an AI that's not owned by anyone, no governments can control it, no one can access the data, it's all very safe and secure, but it's kind of just watching everyone and looking for behavior patterns, and if it sees something wrong, it notifies the authority. Okay, next, environment. So, we clearly need to do some fucking thing about climate change. It's been hottest month on record, month after fucking month. Gotta do something. The world's governments have had decades to do something, and they've done nothing. Um, and even if they do something, it's all gonna be emissions trading schemes at a national level only. The whole point of emissions trading schemes is to put a price on the negative externalities affecting the, the environment. Um, the problem is, like, the Earth is a single entity, it's a single amorphous greenhouse. So it'd be much better to have a global emissions trading scheme that is not owned by any government. No government controls it, no government regulates it, it self-regulates, it's running on the blockchain, it's a DAO, it's an open marketplace. So you can start with this idea of like how do we create a global uh, emissions trading scheme uh, system on the blockchain. So almost like you'd make your own cryptocurrency and you'd have people buy in and have that whole process happen globally. What ETS does is it sets the limit of uh, carbon emissions or pollution you're allowed to do. If you go over that, you have to pay uh, credits per amount that you pollute. So there's an incentive for you to reduce that. So if companies go over the limit they're allowed to pollute, then they're forced to pay credits and that cuts into their profits. So at some point, there's an economic incentive to create carbon offsets, so solar, wind, trees. One idea here I had a few years ago was this idea that um, there's all these satellite companies launching now. They're launching constellations of satellite and free API access to all the data and all the sensors on those satellites. 
So you could create an automatic system that just monitors every single polluter in the world, every single carbon emission, because you'd actually be able to accurately kind of like watch the factories and see how much they pollute. If the sensors are accurate enough on these, on these satellite constellations, you can easily kind of monitor where the carbon and pollution is exactly coming from, get that GPS coordinate and pair it to a company. So now you're automatically monitoring the entire globe and all of the polluters around the entire world. Um, then you can upload all that data to the blockchain where it's distributed and anyone can access it. Then you can create an emissions training scheme cryptocurrency that's accurately paired to that data. And so now you create this economic incentive or profit drive for people to actually pollute less. Ideally, this, this system would be global and operating quite well, and governments would actually start adopting it um, as their legal framework and, and start enforcing that on companies, or you find some other market-based mechanism to incentivize. These satellite constellations can also automatically monitor all environmental destruction around the planet, and you can actually map that and, and report it and make it public on a blockchain. And wealth distribution. So governments are definitely not going to increase taxes on the rich, they're not going to increase taxes on companies, they're definitely not going to close the tax loopholes that companies currently employ. A decentralized basic income system globally will help kind of enable people to get out of poverty and stop having to work for bullshit jobs at minimum wage just to get by. And if we all use a cryptocurrency on a daily basis, it's easy enough. Uh, it's an idea I've talked about called Isocoin many times. Then you uh, get rid of the money making power, money control power from governments and banks. And because you can still have a, a very strong uh, ID system to pair yourself to the blockchain, but you can also make that anonymous. Anonymous blockchains, anonymous cryptocurrencies can't be taxed. And by their very design, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, you can see all the code and you can see exactly how it works, but then you can clone it. So if they're charging too high a fee, you just clone it with a lower fee. And once they're matured, like you know, they're having issues at the moment with DAOs, but it's the first time it's ever been done. Once they're matured, you don't have any human bias because there's no one controlling it, it's just code. And so DAOs operate at zero profit. They tend towards zero, zero profit. All they need to do is generate enough revenues to keep the systems running, to keep that service running. And so that's for the benefit of all humanity. So with the rise of all these online digital kind of monopolies because the capitalist system can't handle this new thing like Facebook and Uber and Twitter and Airbnb, instead of all the revenues and profits going to the investors and founders, it goes to the people. And so if all these DAOs are operating at near zero profit for the benefit of all humanity, to the value add to all humanity and for the social good, then they can also uh, add dividends to this whole basic income concept. Like you want a basic income, you want to get paid uh, a, a weekly fortnightly amount to cover all your rent and food and electricity and clothing and all that sort of thing, which DAO do you go for? Do you use the DAO that gives 0% back to this uh, basic income blockchain distributed system? Or do you use the one that gives 2% or 5% or 10% or 20%? I can see it very quickly moving to a world where DAOs and all this kind of blockchain based stuff kind of decentralizes everything. There'll be no centralized governments, no centralized businesses, no centralized control. It's peer to peer. We gotta take the power back! And that's how the revolution will be written in code. Back your thoughts. Back your thoughts.